Okay, Ronald. <laughs> yes. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of McCoy. I am Ronald Marzette, along with our lovely guests. We have Elle, we got Erica, Jeannie, Toby, and our special guest, the one, the only <laughs> Reverend Wendy Hamilton. <laughs> on the channel. He is such a, a change maker. She's influential. She's inspiring. She's a friend to all of us. This is like awesome. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll pay you later for that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. And so tonight's episode is really, really important really dear to all of us. And we are talking about mental health in the black community. And we're gonna have this open dialogue, this open discussion, and pretty much get the conversation going because again, in most black communities, that's kind of like a stigma that black folks does not have a mental illness or they think that they rub it off and think it's crazy. And so we're going to pretty much address it here and, and have again have that dialogue so that we can all be better equipped and be able to handle you know those those things that come at us and so who wants to take it away as far as asking for a question or how we're going to do this yeah so the first question is since you have a tell us a little bit about your background when it comes okay. to mental health yeah that's what i want to do but before we jump in can i at least you know introduce myself a little bit for those who might yeah. not know me. Yeah. Uh, so yes, my name is uh, Reverend Wendy Hamilton. I am originally from Ohio. Go Buckeyes. Mm. Uh, whatever, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I moved to Washington, D.C. to attend Howard University, and I went there for my undergraduate degree in early childhood uh, educational studies. And then I went back to seminary after I felt a personal call to ministry. So I graduated from Howard University School of Divinity. Uh, since that time, I have worked in pastoral care as a chaplain uh, at Georgetown University and also a trauma hospital chaplain at Johns Hopkins in their emergency room. Uh, I did that for several years uh, before becoming ordained and going into pastoral ministry. So I most recently pastored the Open Door Metropolitan Community Church here in the, the DM, DC area out in Maryland. Uh, I did that and um, most recently also had the pleasure of serving as the Director of Spiritual and Cultural Outreach for the presidential campaign of Andrew Yang. So, we are just so, I just want to say it again, we are so excited that you would take time out of your really busy schedule to talk about mental health because it is a really important issue and it's something that is impacting, it is impacting the black community, but it's also impacting all communities. And I think as long as we take the time to educate ourselves and learn more about it, we can all be better. So um, Wendy, how would you describe um, mental health awareness or what mental health is? Well, I think, you know, in a nutshell, mental health is just about taking care of our mental capacity. And that, that includes uh, how we feel, how we express, how we speak, how we navigate, how we process, how we understand, how we interpret, how we perceive events. Um, anything that can have an impact on how we navigate and understand ourselves and the world around us impacts mental health, if that makes sense. Yeah, it, it does. Um, the, our first question is from Elle. She's going to ask the first question, so go okay. for it. Sure. Okay. 
Yeah, so the first question is, it's, it's about mental health and social media. So mm -hmm. like, how do you feel social media impacts one's mental health? So I've got notes here, so I, but, I'm, but I'm also naturally like an ad libber too. So I'm gonna kind of go back and forth if you don't mind. Yeah, um, so, but let me start by just saying that, that uh, social media can have a significant impact on our mental health, particularly if your mental health is already compromised in, in an area of say depression or loneliness or isolation participating in social media can exacerbate some of those issues for us, particularly uh, because of the isolation that social media offers. The more time you spend alone and on social media and not fostering in-person, in real life relationships, the less development you get. There's, there is a social development um, that takes place when you are interacting with people in real life, people that you know, people that you are invested in, people who are invested in you. When you cut off or limit those relationships and then begin to establish sort of superficial ones with people you don't know and who you may never meet, there really then can be no accountability for you when your mental health starts to become affected by those folks on social media. And mm. so, um, for young people in particular, we hear a lot about cyberbullying. And that's a big issue among our young people. Yeah. Where they are being, uh, they're already maybe feeling a little down about their social situations at school. And maybe there's some bullying at, at, at school, on the school level. They don't feel comfortable talking to anybody. So then they turn to their online friend to maybe talk to them about it. Someone who don't doesn't know them, doesn't understand the context. And that person has 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 no respect then for what this you know what you might be going through. So they pile on, and then they get other friends to pile on, right. and then there's no accountability for you. Now you feel extra isolated. Now not only are you being attacked by people who have an opportunity to get to know you better, you're also being attacked by people who don't know you at all. And if you do not have a strong sense of of your own mental stamina that can wear you down. So that is what social media is doing. It is isolating us. It is, it is cutting off our ability to interact with one another in real life that adds and lends a credibility to us that social media cannot. How many of you on here can meet up with somebody and you can look at them and you know they're not really having a good day, even though they say, oh, I'm fine. Yeah, definitely. Right? Mm -hmm. But that doesn't that doesn't transpire on social media, right? So you can be really down and someone can ask you, oh, how are you doing? And and what are you saying to them? Oh, I'm fine. Oh, look, I went to the ice cream shop today and they're putting up all these pictures and putting up this false sense of what's really going on with them. Right. And not having that interaction, you cannot have the accountability to look them in the eye and perhaps know that they're not being truthful about how they really are feeling. Yeah, I just to piggyback on something that you said earlier when it comes to like kids and, you know, social media, I know that many schools are going to be going into a blended learning program where it's like half online, yeah. half um, at school. But there are those pockets where kids are going to have more time to be on their phones because obviously if they're at home, we can't monitor them. We can't see if they're on their cell phone or not. And so something that I am, I'm encouraging and I'm doing with in my classroom, and I know other teachers are, is promoting digital citizenship and trying to educate kids on the importance of like the cyber bullying piece and how to um, how social media can impact them. So I think what you said also can trickle down to young people as well right. as we're starting to get acquainted with social media. Right. Um, our next question for you is, it comes from me. As right. black Americans, we are exposed to a lot of trauma, but we don't always acknowledge it as trauma. Why do you think that is? And what can we do to deal with that? Woo! That was a big one. So let me uh, <laughs> flip over to my notes on that because um, trauma in the African-American community um, goes hand in hand, unfortunately. And it is rooted in the way we were brought here, 
we were brought here under very traumatic circumstances. And so even a lot of the trauma that you see playing out in our communities is residual and left over from the experiences that we had that were transferred or passed down, some of it subconsciously even. And so we are a people who are familiar with trauma. The one thing about that though, is that in the days that we were having those experiences, we were oftentimes chastised or beaten for expressing how we felt about that trauma. Yeah. And when you are someone who is made to feel less than or unworthy, or um, you feel threatened about expressing how you truly feel, then you develop this false sense of strength, of not giving the impression that you are weak. Because if you did that, then particularly in men, and I know that's a later question and we'll get to that, but you could face threats of harm. You could, you could be beaten again. You could get more lashes. You, you were accused of not being a, a, a strong man. And so what we have learned to do in the black community is to survive. Mm -hmm. And so to survive, that has translated into somewhat of a suppression of how we truly feel. Because we were not made to feel that our feelings and expressions were worthy or were valid or were validated. Yeah. And then that went on across time and became socialized as weakness. So it, it now became weak for men or even black people in general to express how they felt about trauma in their lives and trauma happening to us. And, and for men, again, we'll get into that. It then became effeminate for men to express how they feel. And so there's been, we have to look, we can't look at what's going on currently before we dig into what happened historically. Yeah. You know, so, so, because that's still, that's sort of the backdrop um, against where we are today and the way that we navigate mental health and trauma issues today. So the other thing I want to point out um, real quick, and this I'm going to have to read my notes because it's a definition. I don't really uh, like talking about things without fully defining them because one of the one of the reasons why we don't uh, know trauma or, or express it is because we don't know, we don't define it. We don't know what it is. And I'm, I'm a big proponent of naming a thing a thing. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, that makes sense. Well, let me just read this to you. It says, you know, trauma. We are subjected to a tremendous amount of trauma in our lives, particularly in the African-American community, much of it rooted in our very arrival on this continent. So the tra traumatic experiences that brought us here still linger in our psyche. Trauma is defined as a deeply distressing, disturbing experience. Okay. A deeply distressing or disturbing experience. But then there's psychological trauma too, which is damage to the mind that occurs as a result of this distressing or difficult event. Trauma is often the result of an overwhelming amount of stress that exceeds one's ability to cope or to integrate the emotions involved in that experience. Yeah. And so that is when trauma occurs. So there's the, there's the trauma itself, you know, in terms of whether it's uh, someone who's uh, died, you experience a loss or, or you, you know, or someone's been beaten or, or you've been diagnosed with a terminal illness or something like that. So there, that's the initial, the trauma itself. But then the psychological trauma is how you process that trauma that happened. And so when any time trauma is inflicted on us or anytime we experience that, um, we, have a chance in that moment to decide how we're going to process it. If it's too much for our minds to handle, we will suppress it. We will minimize it because we have not dealt with ourselves enough and dug enough into our capacity to process traumatic events. It's just easier to go um, not to acknowledge that it's as painful as it is and redirect our energy into something else. 
let me, let me give you an example. Anger, you can be angry about something that happened to us. And, and a lot of times trauma can, is expressed in anger. People get angry and they, they fight back. But it has been discovered in studies that anger a lot of times is a cover up for hurt. You're actually hurt, but you don't have the language to talk about the hurt. So it's easier to lash out in anger. Does that make sense? Oh, it, it really does. <laughs> so, it really does. Yeah, so I wanted to put that out there. Go ahead. Oh, Jeannie, sorry, Jeannie wanted to say something, I think. Go ahead. I wanted to ask, like, if we could go around, which one of these uh, popular or more mainstream uh, police brutality cases do you think hits you the hardest mentally? Like, these have all hit me, like, mentally at different rates. And for me in particular, it was definitely that Breonna Taylor case from recently. Like, these police essentially just broke down the door, walked in and fired six shots or however many shots into this woman. And I was uh, talking to this, another young woman recently and we were, and she's a very positive person, you know, like, oh, all cops aren't bad, you know, we can reform this. And was speaking on another young lady who has gotten pretty semi-radical, that's on the other end of the spectrum. And I'm sitting here, like, I'm kind of like defending, you know, trying to make her see why this more radical woman would think the way she does. And, and like, through this whole meeting, like, I'm just thinking, like, if this, like, happened to someone like you, I would, I would feel that way, too. Like, we all know someone who could, like, be in this situation, and it's horrific. And, I, and it's just really hard to think about. Anybody else? Um, I would say the, honestly, like the George Floyd, um, death was the most traumatic for me. I didn't like, I honestly didn't watch like the entire 10 minutes. I kind of like skipped through it. And like the entire time I was just like, no way, no way. They're not going to really just like kneel on his neck this whole time. And I honestly, and this was like the first time I've ever like done this after seeing and witnessing, like, like seeing all like these police shootings or like these police killings. And I actually like pictured my brother, like one of my brothers as George Floyd, like, and I almost lost it. Mm. I, I, and I, that's something that's never happened to me. I'm like, I'm usually like a, just a cool, calm person. And, and I was mm. just like, you know, like I'm, I'm not like financially stressed, you know, like I, I'm, I still have my job, like nothing is like, you know, like causing even more stress in my life, you know, like my, all my family is, you know, like happy and healthy. But like, you know, if somebody like in my position, like if that were to happen to any of my siblings and, and like, that's how I would react, you know, it's like, I just can't imagine, well, like, well, I can and I can't like, you know, like I told, like, I understand why, like how people can just, can lose it. How people can, you know, just, yeah, can just lose it. Can like their, you know, like they, like the switch. Like I, I could definitely see that. That was just terrifying to like feel that. Cause I didn't know that was like even in me. What about you, Toby? Yeah, I was thinking both with Breonna Taylor's, just the craziness of you know, there's not that any of these cases were excusable, but really there's no provocation. There was wrong information and that just how that could happen to anyone. And the fact that there's really been no justice around it has been sort of the most like, wow, like this is actually continuing to happen as we speak. One person was fired and it just kind of makes you think like, wow, something like this could happen to anyone that we know It would rock our entire world and nothing would happen. Um, which is like a really depressing thought to think about. And I mean, there's more pressure being put, but that, that was, that's one of those ones that like, it kind of, it didn't slip, but it's, you know, it's kind of been quieting down and we have to keep the pressure on it. Um, another one that happened actually, I think a year ago, but it's been getting more attention to Elijah McClain. Um, really horrifying video and story. Like it was the guy 
who he was walking home and I guess someone called the cops saying he looked suspicious because he was dressed a lot. Um, Cause I think he had, he was anemic. So he was dressed in a lot of clothes. Um, from what I heard, this was like the sweetest kid. He played violin for cats. I played violin. Like he was an introvert. I'm an introvert. Like there were certain things that I kind of just related to. Like what if I was just walking home alone and the police kind of like stopped him. I guess he, he didn't, you know, stop walking in time. So then they like put him on the ground and he was like crying and he was saying all these things like, you know, I'm so sorry. I, I forgive me. And you're beautiful humans. Like, I think he, you know, just his mind was going all over the place and there was like no sympathy for him. They injected him with like ketamine and he went to cardiac arrest, I believe, um, and died. And it was just, it was just really like, if you, if you see the info about it, it's just like, how does something like this happen to something, somebody so like unassuming and, you know, that I was really just reading the information for that earlier this week. I've heard of it in past weeks too, but like I was listening to some of the body cam footage, just like an hour and a half, you know, definitely didn't go through all of it. And it's very hard to listen to. And I'm just like, wow, like there's just so many of these cases that people didn't really, oh yeah, that was Aurora, like I think Colorado. And there was like a million, there was a lot of people who signed a petition and the, the office said that they were not gonna reopen the case because of public opinion, um, which is like really trash. Um, mm -hmm garbage um I, I mean it could go to the state i think kind of like what happened with ahmad arbor it could go to the i guess the state attorney but it's just crazy like that that one really i was looking and i was like this doesn't make any kind of sense like there's a million different ways that this could have happened it could have called some like wellness check on this person if they seem like you know who's this person why are they walking alone but it just turned into violence for no reason um, a lot of these cases really could have been solved with a different alternative to the police, um, which is kind of the whole thing that's being pushed. And it's just, you know, this is the humanity that's not present a lot of times in these situations, um, whether because people are perceived as a threat or just, it's just crazy, like the accountability and the lack of it. And just, you know, there's no thought that this could maybe be the wrong person or that this person shouldn't lose their life. It's just like, it's a very heavy thing excuse me, but what so about, I'll say those. I was going to say, what about you, um, Wendy, which one has the greatest impact on you? Well, honestly, I, you know, I'll just, I'll be honest with you. I've, I've, I've seen many. Okay. You know, I can, you know, Tamir Rice had an effect on me. Trayvon Martin had an effect on me. I mean, this is, this has been going on, you know, long before, of course, Brian, Sandra Bland had an effect on me. Uh, and so, I, you know, George Floyd, it, it's gotten to the point where I, you know, because we're talking about mental health, one of the, one of the ways to strengthen mental health in the black community is to take charge of your own mental health and to recognize your limits and to practice vigilant self-care. And for me, I have to practice vigilant self-care when it comes to viewing traumatic events, particularly black people being killed on television. I cannot watch it loop over and over and over again. That is hits on our psyche. There's a terminology in the industry that says at some point it becomes trauma porn to see lives being lost over and over. I mean, sure it gets ratings, but you have to think about Every time you watch that, your, your psyche is taking another hit and another hit. And so I don't need to see it on repeat in order for me to understand and, 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 and sense how disturbing it is. I could not, I have not watched the full George Floyd tape. I could not watch the Ahmed Arbery tape. I certainly would not even want to see the Breonna Taylor tape because I already know the end story. I don't, I know what it is. And so for me, in a way to protect my own peace of mind and my own mental health, because I'm telling you now as a mother, I, it would have been very difficult for me to hear George Floyd call out for his mama as he oh, laid there down. That dying. was horrible. That was horrible. So for me, I don't need to see it. I certainly don't need to see it on repeat, but that's because I'm trying to protect my own mental health. And that doesn't mean I can't be as outraged about it. That doesn't mean that I don't understand how devastating and tragic. And you're talking about someone I mentioned it to you. 
I was a chaplain. And chaplains are the people who go in and sit with people who are actively dying or dying. So I've sat at the bedside. I have watched people take their last breath. I have held their hands. I've held their family's hands. I held the hand of a mother while she walked to the operating room to have, she, her daughter had just died, 13 years old, and she had uh, decided she wanted to um, donate her daughter's organs so that other children might live. So she wanted me to walk with her to the operating room as they, she was preparing to say the last goodbyes to her dead daughter. So I know trauma up close and personal, but I also know my limits. And so I don't subject myself to it if I don't have to as a self-care mental health protection strategy. So Reverend Wendy, uh, when uh, the school shootings things were happening, there was this giant push with a lot of independent media to stop posting the faces of school shooters or mass shooters, mass uh, murderers, things like that. Do you recommend that mainstream media or uh, social media stop posting videos of these deaths? I, 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 I shy away from recommending it only because it's not necessarily their goal. We, we don't, and we, nor should we look to media for moral clarity. They're there for ratings, unfortunately. I mean, you would like to think that their humanity would override that, but at the same time, if every other station is publishing it and if it's, if it's going on on every other social media outlet, there's sort of a business pressure. And so we, I think we have to be realistic about what their actual purposes are and roles are. And at the end of the day, it is to generate views and it is to, you know, to get up, you know, their ad revenue. So unfortunately, I have to manage my expectations in terms of what I am asking and expecting people to do, because at the end of the day, I, to, to apply a particular morality or humanity to a corporation is, 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 is in this day and age, fairly unrealistic. And so would I like for them to do that and be a little bit more sensitive? Yes. Is, but is that their, is that their duty? No. Their duty is to get you to watch and and have arguments and and you know and the back and forth you know so that they can squeeze an ad in between to tell you hold your arguments so I can get another ad in there and then come back and so I'm not going to hold them to an unrealistic standard because I know who I'm dealing with. Can I'm we? Kind of, can we? I'm ask kind of in the middle of it sorry, because yeah. like if you don't show these videos, people don't know just how horrific it is. The reason they these George Floyd hits so hard is because we see this man take his last breath. But on the other hand, it does hit terribly on people's mental health. It's triggering. So like, what do you guys think? But that's also on us that we feel like we have to see it to empathize with it. You know, we don't, we don't have to see it. I mean, it, it, it makes it more real per se, or not seeing it makes it easier for people to dismiss it. And I would say that these things have been going on for a long time, but this, the George Floyd, because there were more, more eyes on, on it, to your point, Jeannie, that's why we've seen the outcry that we've seen because folks were less distracted. You know, uh, Trayvon Martin, and in those days, people could change the channel. They didn't have to be as engaged. They could turn on a basketball game or they could turn on a golf game, you know, so they, they didn't get to see it. But because we're in this pandemic and a lot of people are, are home, they're not working, you know, they couldn't turn to another, it was on every channel, mm -hmm. so they couldn't look away. They couldn't look away, and that's why you've seen, you know, the outcry that you've seen this time um, more so than others, because more eyes were on it. So I think that there's a duty for that to be done, but I would hope that we are at a place where just hearing that yet another Black man has died, I can get just as outraged whether I saw it or not. You what do you, what do you think of like um, the lynching like the suicides that have been coming out? Um, do you think that those were suicides, or do you feel like what are your thoughts on those? Well, I I, I know Jeannie to ask a question. I don't want to take over the whole program. If anybody else had anything they wanted to to add, yeah, that was, that, oh, that was the question we as a group wanted to ask you. Uh huh. Okay. So I'll give you my honest opinion. My honest opinion is that probably the majority of them were suicides. I will say that to, that does not mean that that some of them were not, but suicide is is it's not a subject that we talk about enough in the African American community. 
uh, particularly because it's very taboo, uh, because it's something that we are socialized not to do, uh, particularly those if you've been brought up in any sort, sort of church setting, suicide is considered a sin, you know, because you're taking your own life and you don't have the right, only God can take your life if you've heard any of those kinds of conversations. Uh, and so the, the, the notion that a black person could, you know, take their own life seems contrary to the way in which we were, we have been raised and socialized historically. What it does not account for, however, is that some of the suicides and the suicide rate in the black community, particularly with young people, has gone up 73% in the last 10 years, 73%. As a matter of fact, and I have a note on it, let me, let me. <laughs> okay. I have this. It says a growing crisis in the mental health and well being of black youth has been described um, in a report. So there's a report, and I'm going to encourage you all to go look at it, that the Congressional Black Caucus put together in 2018. It's called Ring the Alarm The Distressing Increase of Suicide in the Black Community. Amazing. They've gone, they've got statistics, they've got research, they've got you know, conversations that they talked about. And they said, what is driving ultimately the suicides in the black community is untreated mental health issues. Mm. Because of what we're talking about and the stigma in the black community in terms of encouraging us to reach out and to acknowledge when we need some additional support. So if you've got some untreated depression that goes long enough, but you're not in a community where you feel like you can say that because you might be told that you're weak or that, you know, you just need to get over it or you just need to pray about it um, and, and or, or just, you know, go drink some ginger ale and go lay down. And I mean, come on now, you know, back in the day, back in the day. We didn't even call. And, and, and even some of our older if you see some of your older relatives. Y'all know we had uncles that we kept up in a room, you know, that was away from the rest of the family. You know, <laughs> Uncle Jun Junior, everybody knew that Uncle Junior, that that's his room upstairs. They take his food up and sit it out in front of the door. And, but, but nobody wanted to talk about why is Uncle Junior in that room and can't come downstairs. And, you know, they, the excuse you might get is, well, you know, well, Uncle Ju he's got the blues. That's what we used to call it, you know. Well, you know, he's just going through some things. No, he was probably bipolar or he was probably showing signs of schizophrenia or he was probably showing signs of chronic depression, but we didn't want to name a thing a thing. So we just kind of sugarcoated over it and there, therefore these mental health conditions went untreated. Mm -hmm. And so if you are a black young person, you know, or and you're struggling with these and you don't feel comfortable bringing that to someone's attention, it just begins to exacerbate itself. And you become further isolated and then you begin to experience what we call in the industry, suicide ideation and suicidal thoughts of not being able to fully articulate how you're feeling to anyone or to have those feelings validated. Mm. So yes, unfortunately, you know, as a matter of fact, you guys remember Sandra Bland, right? And the situation where she got pulled over down in Texas. She had the uh, busted tail light, they said, and then somehow they, you know, arrested her, took her to jail for overnight, and she wound up dead. And they came out and said that she had committed suicide. And because everybody's trying to figure out that how how did a traffic stop go, you know, have this black woman wind up dead? And they talked about suicide, and so there was a lot of conversation around that, like no, that's a lie, get the tapes. And I don't know what ultimately was decided, but even then a big uh, sort of conversation around the fact that people were so quick to dismiss that that's not what it was without considering the possibility that it could have been. And I think that that's where we are in the conversation in the black community around suicide is acknowledging the fact that whether we want to or not, we struggle with wanting to live or die or, or, or feelings of worth and value the way other cultures struggle, we just don't necessarily access the tools that are available to us to help navigate those feelings. And so I can't speak to all of these recent ones, um, 
But I will say again with the media, we have to also be careful because this brings ratings. So the, the fact that there's been five, there's there's probably been more than that that the media didn't didn't pick up on. But then they picked up on one or two. Then you start looking for them, right? Mm-hmm. Now you start because that's the big story and trying to build out this idea that somehow maybe this is a trend or an epidemic going on. So all I'm saying is I don't know what is the cause or why these men, young men have been found hanging or might have taken their lives. However, I am not going to just completely outright say that it could not have been suicide because it absolutely could have. And at least one of the families has come forward and confirmed that in their case, he had been struggling with uh, depression and it was suicide. So, Ronald, thank you for that wonderful information. Um, it is really important, you the data and the statistics, because we do need to shed light on that. Ronald, do you want to ask Renny the next question? Yes. Um, mind the dogs and the bark in the back barking. Um, okay, I have my kitten here. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the Which one question, is that? <laughs> oh, this one's Milo. He just like literally came uh, and like uh, walked sit on my lap. I'm like, okay. <laughs> uh, righty. So the the one that I want to ask is, how do we get um? more people to pursue a, um, a career in, in mental health? How, how do we educate them to pursue that kind of field? Because like you said before, when it comes to mental health in the black community, we don't necessarily take it as serious. We don't really deal with the issue as what it is. How can we get more black folks to, to take, on a, take on those roles? Well, honestly, there actually are a lot of black people in those roles. <laughs> we just need to seek them out. And, and, mm-hmm. and we need to model for those, you know, in our families and in our communities that this is an acceptable practice. And, you know, some of why we don't seek out mental health um, treatment or, or, or assessments has to do with, you know, the perception that there is a lack of people of color you know, in the in the therapy profession, and that's not necessarily true. It, you you may not need to see a psychiatrist. You could see a psychologist. You can see a licensed professional counselor. There's there's a number. So I think it it involves education about what it is you you need. When right. when we start out saying you need to see somebody, people automatically go to the psychi. Oh oh, so you saying I got to go see a, you know a, a quack or whatever? And then there was there was always this notion. Um, in the African American community, that we're not supposed to put our business in the street. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, you know this notion. Sorry, I'm sorry. My daughter's calling me up. Uh, hold on one second. I'm sorry about that. Um, that we don't go to talk to therapists because it's none of their business what's happening in our house, in our home. There's this mistrust. There's this idea that they're just going to wind up using it against you. And again, where do you think that residual idea comes from? Slavery. It comes from having, you know, sharing you know, things with people only to have it used against you later on. People befriending you and telling you, come on, just share with me what y'all, how'd you learn how to do that? Just share that with me and I promise it'll just be between you and I. And the next day, master's out there saying, oh, I heard you've been doing this and I heard you've been doing that. So that's why I say some of what we're repeating is on a more subconscious level. So this notion somehow that they can't be trusted, therapists can't be trusted because they're just going to use the information against you or they're going to judge you in a certain way. If you come in, it's just better to keep it within the community. So we'll go talk to the pastor, you know, pastor will help us work it out. And and pastor will just tell us, you know, just pray about it and Jesus will make it all right. Well, Jesus said, go see a therapist. Okay. Because you can do the two are not mutually exclusive. You understand what I'm saying? Faith and mental health can work, you know, together and it doesn't have to be an either or in our community. So I think the way that we encourage more, um, African-Americans, uh, you know, people of color to go into the profession is first to utilize the ones that are there to the point that 
we need more because there is a, a supply and demand thing. Yeah. So if, you know, these, these counseling roles, they don't pay a lot of money either. So we, you know, we could give them UBI and <laughs> <laughs> that, that might encourage some more folks, but, um, so, you know, most folks don't go into this role um, looking to become rich. They, they go in because they want to serve and they want to help people. Right. But if you don't have people to help or people are not coming to you, then you cannot, it, it, it's difficult to make a living. Mm -hmm. Toby, you're up. What's your question? Oh, you're on mute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I saw that too. And this is very timely as well. Um, because I was thinking of, you know, so many of us come to, you know, some of us maybe, are, you know, black people will come to get mental health services to, you know, find someone who looks like us, but that field is already limited, like you said, especially when you're in certain, you know, high-end fields like law and technology, you're going to have less and less of these counselors of color. So I was going to ask one, how do you sort of deal with the overwhelming demand of people come in to give you sort of their mental health, you know, to get counseling from you. And then two is how do the black mental health professions get their own mental health? Like what are the coping, I guess, mechanisms that you, you rely on when, you know, everyone is trying to rely on you? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you know, one of the first rules that you understand when you go into the area of, of an arena of mental health, that every therapist needs a therapist. And, you know, how can you be expected to help someone else uh, maintain wholeness and develop uh, a healthy mental health if you're not caring for your own? So you have to lead by example. And so every therapist, is, there, there are therapists, therapists, you know, there, there are therapists who, who specialize in dealing with therapists. And when you are in this kind of a role, you have to find, even as a minister, so I'm not a mental health therapist, but I have been trained in mental health um, sorts of approaches because pastoral care coincides a lot of times. A lot of things people are coming to pray about are actually mental health issues. And so that's another thing that we can do to get more people um, aware of what's available is, is, is counselors who are not of color need to recommend and point out they need to develop networks, you know, and, and a sensitivity around the idea that people of color who are coming to you may prefer to see, uh, you know, a counselor of color. And do you have someone that you can refer them to in case they don't know, you know, which way and which direction to go? So, um, yes, you have to have, I have a therapist, I have a pastor, you know, I have a, a, a spiritual director. So I have those things in place, but that's because I understand, but I'm also just very vigilant about my own mental health care and, you know, being aware of, of symptoms, knowing when something is, is maybe pushing me to my limit, uh, and that, uh, I need to probably seek out some additional support. Let me just share with you guys real quick, if you don't mind. Um, a couple of, uh, these are, I found these. These are uh, six signs of anxiety in black women and six signs of depression in black men. Can I just share that with you briefly? Sure, of course. Okay. Um, Hold on one second, because I, I got to uh, make it brighter with my light, because y'all know I'm old and I can't see. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Don't and I can't see the whole thing, but six, because part of mental awareness and mental health is, is self-awareness, right? Mm -hmm. Knowing, because when you know and recognize things in yourself, then we can recognize them in other people as well. And we have to be careful, um, you know, careful and comfortable when someone comes to you and they say, and you know they've gone through something traumatic. And you tell them, you know, come, you can talk to me. And they're saying, no, I'm fine. I don't need to talk about it. I don't need to talk about it. You know, we ourselves can kind of, you know, monitor and think, okay, they might need some additional help. And perhaps I can try to help refer them or get some resources to them that are beyond just me having a, a chat with them. So this says six signs of anxiety in black women. Number one, stress in outing or events, finding public events intimidating, especially events with large crowds, 
finding yourself preoccupied with how others see you in public, anxiety. Number two, nervous habits. Some develop ticks in their face or find themselves pulling at their hair, biting their nails, or picking at their cuticles. Goal avoidance for women, holding yourself back because you're afraid of possibly being put on the spot or not being able to do it. Worrying, always thinking the worst scenarios about situations, constantly worrying when it's not necessary. Self-medicating, drinking alcohol such as wine, using drugs, or even having increased sexual activities to calm down frequently, anxiety. And six, physical health issues, high blood pressure, rapid heart rate, and sweating are signs of anxiety turning into a potential panic attack. Do any of those sound familiar? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and not just that we see them in, our, in ourselves, but these are things that we can look for in other people. So if you've got a friend who's experiencing it, they may be experiencing anxiety, which gone untreated or unrecognized can develop into a deeper level of mental health, okay? Six signs of depression in black men. Number one, an increase in physical pain or chronic medical issues. Chronic pain and digestive issues can be related to depression. Loss of focus. Depression can slow down a man's ability to process information, therefore impairing, excuse me, impairing his concentration on work. Anger. Men at times manifest healthily excuse me, hostility, aggressiveness, and anger when depressed. It's more than irritability and can strike at the smallest of things. Substance abuse, we all know what that is. Sexual dysfunction, I'm just skipping through these, and suicidal thoughts. So if you have, like I said earlier, anger is sometimes masked depression. It's really that you're hurt and you don't have the words and you don't have the language to explain that. And so you lash out in anger. So the more you are in touch with this yourself and the more we are in touch with ourselves and the more we give ourselves permission to not have to be perfect, to not have it together all the time, to go ahead and allow ourselves to lose it. You know, you were saying earlier, Elle, that, you know, you pictured your brother and you almost lost it. You recognize somewhere apparently that you, you know, were on the brink of losing it. You were able to pull yourself back. Some people aren't able to pull themselves back and they literally lose it. And then they have to go through the steps of seeking out someone who can help them find it and pull it back together. It's great to have that, that information because I think resources are something that we always need to elevate ourselves so we can become more informed and more educated. So I'm grateful that you were able to give like concrete examples so people can, that watch this, can say mm -hmm. like, wow, I know someone or I experienced those, any of those symptoms. Because mm -hmm. if we don't address the symptoms, we can't get the treatment, you right. know? And that's, and that's really important. Right, and you know, I wanna say this too, Mental health is is um, is also about you know environments and environments that we place ourselves in, environments that we place our children in, and and how they are reared. So so some mental health issues, particularly those that develop in young children, stem from the environments that they see around them and the coping mechanisms that they observe their uh, you know adults uh, pursuing. And so if you've never seen if you watched your parent or your, you know, your aunt or your elder or someone have a, a mental breakdown, but, but not articulated as being that or not see them go out and seek resources or help, kids begin to internalize that. And they begin to think that it's not okay if they start having some of the same feelings, that it's something they just have to handle on their own and that there aren't resources available there to support them. I you know, in my day job for right now, I still am working with a local school here in, in, in D.C. as a truancy and family counselor. So I help with uh, families overcome truancy issues and 
and issues regarding obstacles that prevent their children from coming to school on a regular basis, regular basis. And I'm working in the middle school level and the amount of mental health issues that middle school children wow. are experiencing is unbelievable and, and untreated, you know, they're, they're experiencing, you know, some of the depression, you know, depression and, and hopelessness, the anxiety, you know, I said earlier, the cyber bullying that's going on and the isolation, um, they're, they're living in households where maybe their parents are suffering from substance abuse. So there's, there's, you know, sort of ramifications around that as well. So it's also about having conversations about mental health as early as possible and emphasizing the importance of not just our physical health, not just our emotional health, but our, our, our mental health as well. And having and making normalizing those conversations so that when they do come up, they don't seem so spooky and so woo woo and, and, and people just want to change the subject. Yeah. I, I, when Andrew Yang said, um, you know, our kids are not all right. When he was talking about mental health, that's this is kind of the stuff that he was talking about. Mm -hmm. Jeannie, do you want to ask Reverend Wendy the next question? Uh, yeah. Reverend Wendy, why do you feel black men cannot show their emotions? Well, um, I don't want to say cannot. I, I say no. won't. <laughs> you know, at, at <laughs> times, at times, won't. Um, and of, of course, again, we, we alluded to this earlier that um, we've been socialized from the beginning that, that showing of emotions is showing weakness, and that as a man, in order to demonstrate your toughness you need to hold it all together and give this impression that you've got it all together, that nothing moves you, nothing shakes you, nothing, um, nothing can break you. And so we learn to bottle them in, to suppress them. But the, the fallacy in that is that feelings don't necessarily go away or get suppressed. You just, you just take them out someplace else. <laughs> so you may think that you was all tough and hard in that particular moment, you know, you were a man because it, you know, it, it translated from this toughness and not breaking in men to now, if you break, you're weak. If you show emotion, you're weak. And then it even morphed into a femininity. So now you're a sissy, you're a punk, you, you know, and, and, and showing emotions or, and crying suggests or you're gay or, 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 or whatever people would say to discourage young men from showing emotion. But you know what happens? We only discourage people from expressing emotions that we ourselves are uncomfortable expressing. Mm. Now that's the whole sermon, but let me say it again. <laughs> we <I'm sure>. just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I feel my help coming on, so I need to. <laughs> um, we generally suppress the feelings in others that we are uncomfortable expressing in ourselves. Because if I acknowledge that your fear is real or your hurt feelings are real then that means I have to admit that I've had some hurt feelings that I had that I did not express because I didn't think anybody would care anything about them. Mm -hmm. So go ahead. Do you have something? I'm gonna ask Ronald, Toby, Jeannie, do you guys feel like you can express your emotions? Well, I, and I was gonna speak on that too because my kids, they, they've asked me this very same question. Like, you know, they always say, well, well, Dad, how come you don't always cry? Or how come this is going on? How, and, and mind you, they they know me. They've been around me. And I told them that the, because of the certain situations that hit me as a man, you know, there's some of them that I can deal with. There, there's some of them that I can handle. The ones that I cannot handle, the ones that I cannot deal with, is like at the time, I may not say anything. I may not do anything. But... I do cry. I do hurt. And it's like, 
it, 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 it's something that, like Reverend, like Reverend Wendy said, especially when I was growing up, it, it's something that is not really encouraged to do. Mm-hmm. And it is something that I, I think that all men should be able to do. You know, there's there was an instance when me and my wife, we had lost our second son. And mind you, he he we lost him while she was still four months pregnant in, you know. And, of course, we went to church like the day after one of the um, the reverends kind of ministered to her and the guy. He was really close to me. He just took me in. He said, brother, he said, it's okay to cry. He said, why do you think God gave you tear us for? Why did he give you a heart for? Because he understands that there's there's some things that you can't laugh. There's some things that you can't bottle in. And sometimes the only way for you to release them is crying. And like right then and there, like I bawled in his in his in his shoulder because I, I couldn't like I was being strong for her and kind of be strong for me. But at the same time, because of how heavy that weight was, I could do nothing but cry. And I cried until like, you know, I couldn't cry no more. And, and he just sat there and he just held me. He was like, you know, he said, brother, he said, you're gonna be all right afterwards. I'm like, Doc, I don't know, but I know that what just happened here, that meant so much. It meant so much be- because, again, being raised in, in, a, um, in an environment where men hardly cried and, and men showed their emotions, you know, it's unreal. But in order to have that space to be able to do so and not feel judged about it, but encouraged to continue, you know, that meant the world to me. And that's just embracing your humanity. And that's what I'm talking mm-hmm. about, Ron. And when you allowed yourself, first of all, you know, the one way for black men to begin to allow themselves to start expressing emotion is to give themselves permission to do it. Mm-hmm. Give yourself permission to do it. No one else, we've, 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 you know, been trained to wait for people to let us know what's okay for us to express and what's okay for us and how it's okay for and, and what's not. And it's not up to anyone else but us. If mm-hmm. I'm mad, I'm going to, if I'm hurt, I'm going to cry. And it doesn't diminish my, my manhood or my womanhood or my personhood in that. And a lot of the violence that you see amongst our young black men is a lack of the ability to express emotion. So if they could just say I'm mad and I'm upset and you hurt my feelings rather than just go get a gun, you know, perhaps we have a little less violence, but they're, they're expressing hurt as anger when really they're, they're just, they're upset. This whole, I, well, you disrespected me. What they're really saying is you hurt my feelings. <laughs> That's what you're saying that you, you hurt my feelings in a deep way. And I don't know how to process or sit with hurt feelings because I've been taught that hurt feelings make me look weak and I got to man myself up. And I'm so upset that you got me so close to in touch with my humanity and I'm gonna kill you for it because that's how scared I am to get that deep within my own humanity. Agreed, yeah. agreed. Ronald, I, like, I'm i so sorry for that. I did not know that that had happened to you. Like I feel I'm so sorry. Yeah, and, and you know, with, with, with if, if we're pretty much in total, that would mean, of course, with the three that are alive now, the one that's passed on, that would mean we have four. And, you know, he he, we have him buried in Kalamazoo, Michigan, for those that's trying to get a, um, a familiar where I'm at. I'm in Three Rivers. And so every time we go to Kalamazoo and the, the street where the cemetery is at, rather than, you know, pulling my because they got construction going on, we kind of like just look at the cemetery and we say, hey, Hey, Jaheem, how you doing? You know, right. we still love you. We still care about you. You know, and and, and again, it, it's one of those subjects that it took a long time, right. like like years, to, right. to be able to have that conversation and not tear up about it. You know, I mean, there, there's sometimes when my kids, you know, they get teary-eyed about it, especially my oldest, he gets teary-eyed about it. But we, I'll be right we let, back. Yeah, we let them know that it's okay. You know, it's okay to cry. It's okay to show your emotions because you're human. I don't know somebody in the in the chat said that yes, we're human. We're not robots. That is true. That is so true. We, we have to be able to show our raw emotions. You know, and, and to be able to be vulnerable 
but know that in that state of vulnerability, I know somebody else in the chat said that that equals strength. And again, that person who said that is absolutely right because if we think we're always rock hard, you know, 24 seven, seven days a week, we're gonna, somebody's gonna mess around and find that Achilles heel. And that one thing that, that you try so hard to protect, that's gonna be the one thing that's gonna crumble you. And from there it's like, what do I do? Like, it's okay. It's okay to, to, to let your emotions flow in a positive way where it's going to help you to become stronger, you know, the next time around. What about you? Um, and that's awesome, um, Ronald, like what you just said. Um, Toby, Jeannie, what about you guys? Yeah, I think, like, I, I don't know if I would say my friends or family has sort of taught us that emotion was not okay. Um, I think just naturally I can be very stoic, very kind of laid back, and I don't often process or express the emotions, particularly the darker emotions, like even like with crying and like being like really, really sad. Like I, it's usually something that I just kind of hold in myself. And then, you know, I've not really blown up on anyone or anything, but I definitely know that these kind of outlets aren't always there. Like when I talk with good friends and guy friends, you know, it doesn't necessarily come out like, you know, what we really struggle with outside of the day to day, like when it comes to some of the deeper and the emotional and the, the existential crises and these types of things, like I've been trying to talk to people more about this, but a lot of times, you know, it can be very surface level. It's, it doesn't get as emotional. I mean, if anything, sometimes it's talking with some of my close female friends where some of these conversations and some of these kind of emotions and feelings can come out. And I don't want to like burden them with like my whole life. Um, but I definitely do think that, you know, having these kind of group discussions and being able to be more like in tune with, you know, what what are we actually feeling? Like, like the, the big thing I think someone was saying about like, yeah, my feeling, you were saying one day about like, oh, that hurt my feelings. And yeah, I can get to that extreme. And that's like very, very ugly when it gets to the point of wanting to hurt someone else physically or right. even take their life. Um, and they're just, but even for me, like there are times where it's like, wow, that, that thing did hurt my feeling or that thing did make me feel some type of way. And I'm like, not good at all. A lot of times at expressing. So, you know, I'll just kind of like hold it in or just kind of like, you know, be quiet and just let it pass. Um, and just kind of hope that, you know, I don't think too much about it, which isn't good. Right. So that's something that we really do need to be taught more. Um, personally, something that I need to work on is just kind of like, I think maybe it's because I don't want to, you know, cause a conflict. That's another thing. So it's just like, you know, whatever that I'll just take it as a joke or just, you know, push it to the side. But being able to really just express, you know, what happened process. It is a difficult thing when, you know, you haven't been socialized to necessarily do so um right or you you know like i'm christian myself but you know if you're just taught to kind of like pray and you know meditate on it but without actually talking to other people and being really honest about it you know it's, that's not that's not really good to just kind of bury it bury it away um yeah that's not healthy and something you said and they're probably not not putting you on the spot but it, you know my ears you know kind of perked up a couple of times like you were talking about when you said crying and how you try not to go into the dark emotions like crying is a dark emotion rather than a human expression. You know what I'm saying? I'm not, you, you understand what I'm saying? You didn't even know that you said that, but that's how it's perceived. That some crying, which is a very natural, perfectly healthy human response to being hurt or be, or, or to grief like Ron was talking about. And, and yet we've been somehow taught that it, the, the, that's too heavy. That's too much. That that's overdoing it. You know, that's that's going to a, a place of no. Some of us, really, to be honest with you, we don't want to cry because if we let ourselves cry, we might not stop because we've gone for so long and not given ourselves permission. I remember, you know, uh, going into uh, therapy for myself some years ago, and as I started talking about some trauma that I experienced in my own life around my mother dying at a young age. And I, you know, I recognized I needed to talk through that. And, you know, as I was talking about some of the experiences I had with her, I began to cry. And, um, you know, I would say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And she said to me, why do you keep apologizing for crying? You don't have to apologize for how you feel. You have the right 
to feel that feeling, you probably need to cry. So let me get some more tissue because you probably, she said, and you probably need to hit something. So let me get some pillows because I don't want you to hit me, you know. But come on, come on, girl. Yes, yeah, come on, said, girl. You, you got some stuff in there that you need to know that you are worthy enough and allowed to express and let out. And for so long, you have been dismissing yourself, you know, and, and, and the value of your own feelings to keep other people comfortable mm -hmm. at the expense of yourself. Yeah. And so we need to flip that to understand that we're just as worthy to feel however we're feeling um, as anyone else is. It's not our responsibility to make other people feel comfortable. It's not really even our responsibility to be strong for other people. Sometimes we both gonna fall apart and it's okay. Mm -hmm. Because that's, you know, it's about being realistic and acknowledging what it is that we're feeling because that's a part of self-worth that's a part of owning your dignity and and recognizing that you are allowed to feel how completely how you're feeling and that helps your mental health because now you're not suppressing anything and it's not going to come out later in uh, uh alcohol addiction or drug addiction or a, a road rage incident or going off on your coworkers, or for many adults, unfortunately, with their untreated mental illness, guess who they take it out on? The kids. Children. They're children. Parents who don't seek out and have their own mental health, and that was part of my, my mother struggled with some addiction issues, and she was sort of in denial and didn't want to get therapy, of, you know, so a lot of, you know, when she would go through her negative cycles, I had, you know, me and my brother caught the brunt of that. And when you're a child and defenseless, you just take it on and you excuse it because it's a parent. But, but later on, you get an opportunity to uh, deal with it because you start seeing things play themselves out in your own life. And you're like, wait, why am I acting like that? And you realize it's residual from how you were raised and what you saw in the example that was set for you that you didn't deal with then. And so now it's playing out in your own life and you got to go back and you got to own that and you got to reverse your thinking around that. Um, Rev, we have a question from the chat. Um, L, do you want to read it? Oh, uh, by Joy Briggs? Yeah. Hmm. Um, so <laughs> Joy Briggs says, there's a myth that POC feel less physical pain. So treatment is blown off by providers. Does this cross over to mental health or getting medications, ERC? I'm not sure what ERC is. Med 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 et cetera. <laughs> oh, 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 that's true. <laughs> Yeah, in a sense that it's the same sort of principle of prize uh, applies in a sense that the myth that black people don't experience, you know, or they experience less pain, whether it be physical, emotional, or otherwise, is because we don't tell you always how much pain we're really in. We don't want to acknowledge how much pain we're really in. And so it sort of, it sort of um, fortifies this myth. That oh well well they can take it look I'm you know I'm I, I'm giving him a, a, a bigger needle than I've given you know some of the the larger patients and and he he didn't even whimper he didn't but that didn't mean it didn't hurt he just <laughs> you know he just decided I got to be a man about it you know and and vice versa you know black women and again going back to slavery you know were forced to have children and get back out in the field later on that day. So it didn't matter if you had pain. It didn't matter if you were still bleeding. It didn't matter if you had had some complications because you were there, you were a product, you were owned. And so you were not, your pain was not validated. And that's what I'm talking about. So we learn those practices. Even now I have to get on my black male friends about going to the doctor. Go to the doctor. Okay. I'm I see y'all looking away. Y'all been to the doctor lately? G, Toby? All, all y'all's yeah. eyes went that way. Um, <laughs> but but black men historically stay away from the doctor until they absolutely just cannot take it anymore. My and dad's good at going to the doctor. He is very, like he is so good at going to the doctor. It's like I'm like always so proud of him. Yeah, well, he needs to get his friends and tell them, come on, cause you know, <laughs> black men will be sick. They'll go to work, they'll die on the job 
you know, and because they didn't let the family know because they didn't want to appear weak, but they've been having heart palpitations. They've been having shoots of breath, you know, and all of these symptoms, but they're afraid that if they go and find out what's going on with them, then that means that they may not be able to work. Therefore, they may not be able to provide. Maybe they're, they're you know, so they might feel worthless or so ties into mental health. So it's just a vicious cycle that if we don't take care of our whole selves, not just our physical, but our whole selves, it can if we have a negative net impact on our communities. Agreed. Those are strong words. I, I like What's that? That's another saying? strong word. That was like a word. I, I appreciate everything that you've been saying. Yeah, for sure. Seriously, you, you bring wisdom, girl. I know. <laughs> All right, Jamie's gonna ask the final question. I know we're over time, so sorry, but you're just dropping so much knowledge. But Jeannie, do you wanna ask Rev Wendy the final question? Uh, yeah, sure, I can do that. Um, how, how do we go about removing the stigma of mental health and why is there a stigma? Well, I think we've kind of covered that. You know, The stigma is there because it's kind of always been there historically and we haven't really done our due diligence in, in breaking it down. But really the, the best way to break down any stigma is, is through experience. Cause I, you know, we can tell somebody all day long, it's safe, you're okay, you should go to therapy, but modeling it for them, modeling it before folks is really how, um, you know, people become more trusting of, of systems. And, and also modeling for them taking care of their own mental health because you know you when you start getting in touch with your own mental health and setting limits for yourself honoring your own boundaries and things like that there's less of a chance you might need therapy it's okay that if you get to a place where you've done all these things for yourself and you're still you know still struggling and you might need some additional supports but we just have to be better about teaching people how to take care of themselves to recognize some of those signs that are that are you know read to you as, okay, maybe you biting your nails incessantly is, is not just you being nervous. You know, maybe there's something deeper going on with you because now I see you last week, I saw you and you know, you were, you know, biting them down to the quick. And now I'm seeing patches of hair falling out of your head. Something's going on and you need, you know, you let's talk about it because there is a chance you, you might need some additional support. What are you doing for yourself? What, how are you taking care of yourself? If you're in a stressful job, stressful, you know, most jobs, most corporations now have EAP, employee assistance programs. You know, by law, they have to have, um, you know, counseling mechanisms in place, resources for employees to seek out if they need some additional mental support. So, Breaking the stigma is about not just talking about it, but actually being about it and being vocal about it, like in your friend circles, feeling comfortable enough to say, look, y'all, I'm going to therapy because I got some stuff and I appreciate, you know, I appreciate all that you all have offered. But but I know what's going on in me requires some some deeper, more skilled kind of assessments for diagnosis and anybody that cares about you truly and deeply will understand that and won't make you feel bad, won't won't bring you down, won't judge you, won't humil you know humiliate you in any way. Matter of fact, they'll applaud you for trying to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a preach. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just talking yeah. about it. You've about been it. amazing, Reverend Wendy. <laughs> Thank yeah, you for so sure. much for coming on the channel. Thank you to everyone yeah. that's in the chat that's supporting this channel. We want to keep having these really important conversations. Ronald, do you want to wrap it up? Why should I start playing our, our end song? So we can Hold dance on. Let me ask, was there any other questions? That, was there anything else in the chat that I... Did oh, I yeah, I chat questions. Are there any questions in the chat? We should... We should there there was definitely ask, like, answer any chat questions. Okay, because I, I saw some popping up, but I really I couldn't answer them, so I wasn't sure. Yeah, uh, I was. I'm trying to get some, and it, it's like folks are coming in and just just like rapid fire, rapid fire. Because I, I think a lot of people in the chat they identified with a lot that you have said, and you know, a lot of people they've come to to pretty much to listen. And to kind of mm -hmm. understand and, and educate themselves 
so mm-hmm. they can turn around and help educate other people, which is why we basically started off this channel was for that purpose, right. was to help educate as many people that want to listen, keyword that wants to listen, right. and, and be able to engage in an environment where they don't feel put down, but more so they feel better about Sorry, fireworks are going out. I think they're fireworks. Sorry, I got scared. (laughs) Sorry, I don't know what that was. Sorry. Well, let me just say this for anybody that's watching and anybody here, uh, everybody here as well, that uh, your mental health is as important as your physical, spiritual, and emotional health. And that um, every one of us could use a professional to talk to from time, even when things are going cool. You know what I'm saying? Because we... We mm-hmm. seem to think that we don't need somebody to talk to or to bounce things off of until you know we're ready to jump off a cliff or something, you know, or or things are really about to hit the fan. But it's always good for us to do a check-in. And particularly black folks right now with what we're going through, you know, a lot of the trauma that we see and that we're watching for many folks is triggering things. It's triggering things from their past, it's triggering things from their, you know, from their present. You know that's that's going on, and it's really got people out there on on mental edge, and 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 not to even speak about the economic you know situations that people are going through. People have lost their jobs; they don't have a source of income right now. They're, they're facing eviction as the these eviction moratoriums are about to be lifted. They don't know what they're going to do. And so, yeah, I'm talking to you, y'all. If y'all are out there and you hear my voice, get yourself some help. We need you. We need all of you. We need you to be 100% healthy, 100% whole. And there is no shame in taking care of yourself and prioritizing your mental health. There's no shame in that. I agree. Oh, we, we got one. We got one. Um, this is from Zach, from earlier, from Wendy. And he was asking, is there a cause or group who's working on awareness or help for outreach because he wanted to um like a, a donation to that, uh, that you could think of well i mean off the top of my head no but there are several and and particularly those that are helping to navigate through trauma during this time and um i can get those names and i'll submit those to the group you know i'll, I'll submit mm-hmm. those back to you all so that maybe you can post them as a follow-up for next week but uh, yeah, there are groups that are out there on the front lines right now, specifically designed to assist and support people of color as we navigate these uh, traumatic times. Yes, absolutely. Sweet. Sweet. Yep. Okay, before we end this stream, there's a couple things I want everybody to know. One, uh, we do have um, Reverend Wendy's channel posted in our description. So mm-hmm. please. Once you get done from here, you go over to her channel, you like, subscribe, smash that button, do what you got to do because she's an awesome woman, phenomenal woman of God. And we're just thankful and grateful to have you here to just kind of share your wisdom. Number two, we got Erica. Yes, the lovely Erica Rhodes. She has launched her campaign. We also have her, um, her a link to her campaign page. We will post it in the description below as well. So please, 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 you guys, gang, gang, get this message across. Donate wherever you can. Let's help make 2020 the year that gang, gang takes over. I'm ready in 2022. Ready in 2022. Not 2020. (laughs) I'm starting to increase my chances of winning. There you go. (laughs) Every bird catches the worm. That's all I say. You can also follow me on Twitter. Yes, um, you can follow me on Twitter as well. And yes, my my YouTube channel, I do want to say, is, is more um, ministry related in a sense that you'll find my, my sort of spiritual, uplifting, inspirational talks that I do every week. And, you know, it's, it's new, so I'm still, you know, getting used to it. But um, there's there's lots of new features to come down the pike. I've got some, some great things in the works. So, uh, Go ahead and subscribe, like they said, because I've got some good stuff that's going to be coming up here real soon. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We will. And with that, anybody else has anything? Nope. I have this. I have the song. Okay, here we go. Ready? All right. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks for coming.
Thank you. What you want? Baby, I got it. I do need.